Happy New Year! 2022! It's 2022. I can't believe it. We are so sorry. We took a little hiatus in December, so we don't have any podcasts in December. But we're coming to you in our season two, and we've got some great topics ahead of us. If you haven't caught them already, we've had some great series in the past. We had a vaccination series. We had a summer series. Hot Pet Summer. That was awesome. Well, I think what's... Really important to note is that Andrew has had three quarters of a 6% beer, and he is rosy-cheeked and really loving his life right now. It's Friday. I'm having a good time. And he's not practicing medicine, guys. Just want you to know. And if you're just joining us for second season, we want you to know that we love local beers. We love local businesses. And today, we're drinking Concha Hawken Brewing Company, which... I have been to and can walk to with my dog. And this is their You Can't Catch Me gingerbread ale. Not bad. Really not bad. Not bad. Um, Two out of three people on this couch kind of like it. (laughs) (laughs) I like it. I thought it was pretty good. The other one we have is a Victory, another local beer. Uh, It's the winter special. It's called the Naughty List. Really, really strong. 11%. Um, I stayed away from that because, as Marissa said, 6% does it for me, not 11%. Yeah, so. Andrew is nothing over 10% for Andrew. <laughs> or even 7%. 7% honestly. or less, please. Yes. We are going into a new series this year, and these are called the Pearls of Wisdom. We're going to go through a bunch of different topics over the next several weeks, some of which include, but may include others on top of this, hypothyroidism hyperthyroidism, IBD, diabetes, IMHA, hypertension, pancreatitis, and we'll even split them into, you know, for dogs and for cats. The reason we started this second season of Pearl Series is we've listened to a bunch of podcasts, we listened to a bunch of webinars, and one of the things that bothers me, being a vet out for over a decade now, is In vet school, you learned everything, signalman, history, who gets this disease, et cetera, et cetera. And we waste a bunch of time just going through all of that old stuff. And so what Andrew and I wanted to do was keep it to about under 20 minutes. What is new, mostly in diagnosis and treatment? How are you diagnosing and treating these cases? And we'll touch briefly, like we're talking less than two minutes on what the disease actually is and where you can find it and and what you get to for that. So- We are starting off season two, episode one, is called Marissa Thinks Everything Has Addison's. (laughs) And that is true. When I was practicing full-time in general practice, you know, Addison's disease is really hypoadrenocorticism, as Andrew said, but it's just a lot easier to say Addison. (laughs) And Named after? (laughs) Yes. So I thought this was interesting because I did not know the history, but Dr. Thomas Addison was a British physician, and he actually discussed an adrenal insufficiency in 1855, but they didn't even know what the adrenal gland even was. So the topic of the paper was on the constitutional and local effects of disease of the suprarenal capsules, which is what they used to call the adrenal glands. Yeah, adrenal, suprarenal, similar, similar word. Exactly. So we call this the great pretender because it can look like so many other things. And so I will tell you, if you're a young veterinarian, really keep it on your list, just kind of at the bottom. But this is a disease of the adrenal gland where the adrenal gland has a deficiency of hormones. And the adrenal gland, as we know, is very small, so it's just cranial to the kidneys and does a lot of important things. The way I remember it always is there's the cortex, right, and the medulla. And in the cortex, there's three layers. And the way that I remember these layers is, or how I was taught in vet school, is the salt, sugar, sex layers. And the actual way to remember it, GFR. Yeah, I was going to say GFR. Right, I know. And it's not glomerular filtration rate, but it's... Salt, sugar, sex. I like that better. Yeah, I like salt, (laughs) sugar, sex. But really, what they produce is aldosterone, cortisol, and androgens. And so you need all of those things to live. And if your adrenal gland is not producing those things, you have a deficiency and you have Addison's disease in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. There are two types of Addison's, typical, which involves electrolyte imbalances. And so that's a deficiency of the mineralocorticoids as well as the glucocorticoids. And then there's atypical, which doesn't have the mineralocorticoid deficiency. So it's just glucocorticoids. So really important. Although interestingly, can I just interrupt? Sure. Um, From what I read, mineralocorticoid deficiencies are still present, but the body makes up for it in other ways. So they actually hmm. still have the deficiency, but they're they're somehow compensating in other ways to have that sodium-potassium balance correct. For atypical. Yeah. 
Interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's what I read. I also always forget that atypical Addisonians can turn into typical Addisonians. So we have to continue to think about monitoring their electrolyte. And that makes sense given what I just said too, that like somehow they're compensating then and then they all of a sudden up. they stop compensating. Exactly. Perfect. All right. So what are the ways that Addisons can present? It's waxing and waning signs. So it's not something that's usually acute, although about 30% of the time veterinarians are diagnosing it based on an acute presentation. But a lot of times we'll see, you know, chronic on and off, you know, vomiting, diarrhea, lethargy. Just blah. Also, you know, because of the great pretender thing, you know, megasophagus, you might see that as a presentation. Hmm. So anytime you, you are diagnosing a megasophagus, you should be checking for Addison's. That's a good point. Oftentimes the signs are pretty vague. Right. So yeah, there's obviously, like you said, the chronic like waxing and waning signs. And that's where I start to think that everything has Addison's, right? <laughs> think about it. Glucocorticoids manage stress and they protect and maintain the GI tract. So if you start to see these chronic waxing and waning GI signs and you can't figure it out, run a baseline cortisol, right? And then you have the acute Addisonian crisis that we all fear for these dogs, right? Where they show up in hypovolemic shock right. because they can't balance their electrolytes and they become acidotic. Just to back up, typically you'll see it in younger dogs. But you can see it in older yeah, dogs. Yeah, the literature says, you know, four to five year olds are, are most common, but yeah, you can see it in, in any age. Bearded collies and poodles mm -hmm. overrepresented poodles. and females overrepresented, about two times as many as males. Interesting, okay. So what are we doing to diagnose this? Yeah, I mean, I think you're first gonna run some basic blood work. You're gonna run your CBC and chemistry. And, you know, if it's pretty typical Addison's, you're gonna see a sodium potassium imbalance. So if you see a sodium potassium imbalance of under 27, you're higher likelihood of this being the issue. But there are other reasons for a sodium potassium imbalance, right? If nothing else supports your Addisonian diagnosis, I'm always thinking to myself, what else causes this ratio to be under 27? And there are things like acute kidney injury, yeah. whipworms, chylothorax, pregnancy, which I didn't realize, and if you're on an angiotensin converting enzyme drug. So what other things can you see in the chem that are supportive, but not definitively diagnostic? So you may see an elevated creatinine and BUN, although typically you don't see PUPD. You can. You but... can, but you usually don't. Yeah because they're usually very dehydrated. Mm -hmm. Hypoglycemia? Absolutely. Hypocholesteremia, hypoalbuminemia, high calcium and elevated liver enzymes are possible. In the CBC, something that can point you to it is like an absence of a stress leukogram, right? Because the body cannot react. It needs cortisol to react and, and cause a lymphopenia. So if you aren't seeing that in a dog that's super sick, that can help you. You can also see a mild to actually severe anemia in these dogs, but none of these things are definitively diagnostic. I continually wish that our wellness blood work had a baseline cortisol in it, but it doesn't. And so baseline cortisol would be my next test. And if it's low, it's suggestive, right? Yeah, yeah. And so you have to go to the next test. But if, if your baseline cortisol is over two, you can rule out Addison's disease. So you can stop there. But what if it is low? What if it's under two? What's the next step to definitively diagnose? ACTH stem. Absolutely. And how do you perform it? You collect a blood sample into a red top tube. You administer five micrograms per kilogram of the synthetic ACTH. <laughs> <laughs> and we want you to avoid use of compounded formulations. So after an hour, you collect a second blood sample and you're going to submit them both for cortisol measurement. So what are you expecting in an Addisonian and what are you expecting in a normal patient? Well, ideally, if you were normal, you would actually respond and your body would secrete cortisol. But if you can't secrete cortisol, you're not going to be stimulated, hence ACTH stim, and so you'll be low. This is the definitive test on the ACTH stim. And the great news about it is your lab is going to give you all of those, <laughs> those definitions. You don't have to interpret it yourself, pretty much. Although there's some things that might screw up the test. What would you say about that? So that's an interesting point. Obviously, any glucocorticoid, the oral ones we use, like prednisone can, and methylprednisone can screw up um, your ACTH stim test. But dexamethasone injectable does not screw up your ACTH stim. So if you need to use that in an emergency situation, you can. Great. All right. So you have Addison's disease, and it's not a crisis. Let's talk about treatment. 
Well, first you want to make sure you uh, differentiate between atypical and atypical. So what if it's not an obvious typical Addisonian and the electrolytes are maybe a little bit off, but not, you know, particularly perfect for a typical diagnosis? What would you do to decide if it was typical or atypical? You can send off an aldosterone level. And what are you looking for with that? If the aldosterone levels are normal, then you're looking at just a glucocorticoid deficiency, and that would be an atypical presentation. Let's talk about um, treatment because this okay. is the this is the crux of it. I like to break treatment down into three. T- this is how I think. Right, about like it, right? the acute presentation. Right, and then the chronic typical, and then the chronic atypical. All okay. right. So for the chronic typical, they don't present in a crisis, and you they don't need to be on fluid support. I just think you have to replace all the important hormones yeah. that your adrenal gland is not producing. So you're going to replace it with a glucocorticoid, which is prednisone. We all know about that. Usually starts at a higher dose, 0.5 to 1 mg per kg per day. But the goal is to taper it down to the physiologic or lowest dose or lowest, most effective dose, right? Most of the dogs that I've treated for Addison's end up at like 0.2 mix per kg per day. Of so that's if you're using percortin as well, right? I mean, I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but if you tend to do that. But if you're using <laughs> other drugs that can cover the glucocorticoid deficiency, yeah. then we we don't need to do that. Correct. But I would say, you know, still to this day, the most common combination of treatment of typical is the oral pred and the injectable uh, DOCP. The most common brand name that we know is percortin, but there is actually a new brand name that's made by Decra. And so it's a Zycortol. So less have expensive. Have you ever used the Florinef? I have once. Once. And why did you choose that instead of Percortin? Was it just because that was all that was available to you? Or did no. you want to try it? No. So the owner couldn't bring the dog back in repeatedly for injections every month. And so we tried that. And so there is an oral mineralocorticoid. And that actually also has a little bit of glucocorticoid activity in, which I think is what you were hinting at earlier. Yeah, yeah. Right? If you use fluorocortisone, you get glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid coverage. However, specialists still to this day think it's harder to regulate Addisonian dogs on fluorocortisone because you may need more mineralocorticoid support, but mm-hmm. then you get the side effects of the glucocorticoid support. So you can't you can't actually manipulate it because it's combined in one. And and usually if you're giving that you have to monitor the electrolytes for several weeks after starting it just to figure out the right dosing. And it's more of a pain in the butt than just using Percortin and Pred. Right. So just to recap, for typical Addisonians, we're most likely using oral prednisone, tapering down to the lowest, most effective dose, that's physiologic, and then injectable DOCP, which is a mineralocorticoid supplement. And usually we start that, um, it depends, I don't know what you found in your research, but obviously the label, which I'm most familiar with using is like 2.2 mg per kg IM or sub Q. But some of the specialists I read were starting much lower, like 1.5 mg per kg IM or sub Q. Um, but the monitoring is the most important, which we'll get to later. Yeah, I would just look it up <laughs> <laughs> before I give it. I don't, we are a very practical I don't, podcast yeah, here. I don't, I don't memorize that stuff. I would just look no. it up. All right, so um, for the atypical presentations, we can skip the whole percortin thing, which is great, and you just use the prednisone. Yep, same doses. Same doses, awesome. All right, what if you are in a crisis, you get this dog that comes in with hypovolemic shock, it looks maybe like an Addisonian, if you're Marissa, you think everything in hypovolemic shock has Addison's disease, you run the blood work, You obviously can't do, well, I don't wanna say obviously, but in most general practices, you can't do a baseline cortisol, and so you're just checking your chem, your CBC, and you're like, you look like an Addisonian. What, what are the goals of our treatment of these acute crises? We want to stabilize the patient. So I think fluid therapy is very important. And I know that the most common recommendation now is to use balanced crystalloids. Correct. Yeah. I remember when I first came out of school, it was saline that we were using because we didn't want things with a lot of potassium in them because they were already hyperkalemic. Mm. But now the latest recommendation is balanced, right? Because we didn't want to, we don't want to increase the sodium too quickly. So I'm going to assume that every general practice has some sort of balanced electrolyte solution that you can use in your fluid resuscitation. But the hyperkalemia, depending on how high it is, you may need to provide some extra support there. What would you use? 
Oof, yeah. There's a Hyper- lot. Hyperkalemia, I think, is my least favorite thing to treat, right? You're thinking Addison's disease. You're thinking urethral obstructions, oh, right, in cats. cats. But obviously, the higher your potassium, the more likely you are to have cardiac toxicity. So protecting the heart with calcium gluconate and then, you know, forcing the um, potassium into cells is important. However, you want to be careful in in Addison's disease because they're already hypoglycemic. So you want to make sure that you're balancing those. You also mentioned sometimes they'll present very anemic. So maybe even some blood products would help. Yep. And the tough part about that one is like most general practices are not going to have yeah. blood products. And so they may have to be referred for that once you stabilize them. But the good news is also if I think a dog has Addison's and it's acutely presenting, I am going to give it dexamethasone, right? Right. Not the pred. Not the, not the pred. Not that you would. In not a, that you would shove something yeah, down the dog's exactly. throat. But, but giving dexamethasone IV until you can start the oral pred and then starting the ACTH stim right then and there is, is fine as well. Great. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about monitoring. Then we're done. Should we also talk about a couple of like miscellaneous things? Is there anything? I know else? you like to talk about miscellaneous. I like things. the miscellaneous. So why don't you? Why don't you share <laughs> miscellaneous? <some, laughs> why don't you? Why don't you share some miscellaneous about the Addison's disease? So one thing that I read was that there are certain breeds. They call them the Pacific Rim breeds. You know them best as Akitas and Shibas, and they just you know normally physiologically have a hyperkalemia. So sometimes if they present with these kinds of things and you see hyperkalemia, you might think, oh my God, this dog has Addison's. Hmm. But if you run the ACTH and they and it's normal, you know it's not. What so, about their baseline cortisol? That'll be normal too, right? It should be. Yeah. Cool. All right. So you've you've started the animal on its monthly percortin. You got the pred dosing right. What are you monitoring for and how often? So I think what's really important first off, and you guys all know how excited I am about client communication. It's very important. And it's not just about communicating with the client about what's going on. It's about communicating with them about what they need to do in the future. And monitoring for Addison's disease in the beginning can be pretty intensive. And so I usually always recommend giving out a treatment plan that goes over the first three months of treatment. Because if you're a typical Addisonian, you're going to check the electrolytes at 14 and 25 days, right? So you started on the pred orally, you've given a percortin injection, you're going to check the electrolytes at 14 days. If the electrolytes are still abnormal in Addisonian ways at 14 days, you're going to increase your percortin dose by 10 to 15% at the next dosing time, which is the 25 day mark. If it's abnormal at that time, you're going to decrease the dosing interval by one to two days. So you may be giving it less than 25 days at a time. Mm. If it's all normal, you can usually, and in my anecdotal experience, often extend to 28 days. And then you're going to do electrolytes. The moon cycle. The moon cycle. Precisely. (laughs) Precisely. And then if it's normal, obviously, then I would check it at the next percortin dose as well for three months and then every three months for a year. If it's atypical, obviously, we're going by an absence of clinical signs, really, Mm. and how the dog is doing. But also, like I said earlier, they can become typical. And so in the beginning, you do still want to recheck their electrolytes. So 14 days after you diagnose them, every month for three months, then every three months for one year. So there is a lot of monitoring, and I think it's really important to communicate with the owners about signs they're looking for. How important it is to Maybe monitor. Maybe we should put in the monitoring in our show notes. Andrew, I would love if you would manage our show notes Let's and put all of the things in the Let's show notes. Let's put that in the show notes. You so know, if you guys are listening to idea. this and you're like, oh my God, Marissa just spoke a mile a minute. <laughs> That's pretty normal. It was just me. a lot for me. Having having finished my beer now, it just I'm seemed so like a sorry lot. For your it just seemed like a lot. <laughs> so sorry for your I'm like, 6% I'm beer. I'm going to need to see that in the show notes. For 2022, I think Andrew's <laughs> resolution is to become less of a lightweight. <laughs> And do, go more to the gym on that one. and do more push ups. And do more push ups. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to this season two episode of the Indie Vets Happy Hour. Please tell your friends, all of them, anyone who <laughs> loves pets, vets, techs, anyone in the general public, please tell them about our podcast. We definitely keep it real and we try to be pretty down to earth. It's short enough to listen to in your commute, especially if you're an Indie Vet, because we know you're commuting. Thank you for your help everywhere. If you like us, please leave a review and make sure to subscribe so you can be alerted whenever we have a new episode, which is usually the 1st and 15th of every month. However, we're trying to get more to you quicker. So 
Stay tuned. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.